Hi, my name is Richard Marcus, and I'm the director of the Global Studies Institute here at Cal State Long Beach. Uh, so the Global Studies Institute was created in 2012 to make international integral to what it means to be educated. Every person, every profession, now connected through technology, through politics, through culture, through society. The 12 projects of the Institute at present all focus on creating opportunities for students and faculty and staff to grow their global competencies and approach their interaction with the world with intentionality. So I'm super excited about tonight's event. Um, immigration and the formation of our multicultural identities in our communities is one of the most rapidly changing, complex, um, and exciting concerns of our time. Tonight's speaker, Maz Jabrani, addresses this topic with both humor and reflection. If you can bear with me just a moment, I would like to thank a few people. Um, first and foremost, let me please thank uh, the Kerr's family, Dino, Joe, Alice, Bobby. Bob couldn't make it uh, uh, this evening, but I know he's here in spirit. Um, it's really been a great joy getting to know all of you individually and collectively over the last several years with this event. Uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, Elaine Hagland, who's here uh, this evening as well, CSULB's global visionary, um, our Global Studies Institute fellows, Beta Castillo and Noel Chin. Uh, as I understand it, we have some, some jackrabbits with us tonight, as well as some Bruins from a couple of our local high schools. Um, we have some members of the Global Studies Advisory Board here. Um, uh, as well as a, a great number from the, the greater Long Beach community. And, uh, and then last but certainly not least, let me thank uh, CSULB President Jane Close Connolly. Her tireless support for our campus and students is really an example for, for campus presidents everywhere. Uh, this extends in myriad directions, uh, not the least of which includes support for students who often find themselves at the margins in their daily lives a persistent focus uh, on who we are as a transformative institution and to the point of the evening, uh, the placement of CSULB as an institution dedicated in to ensuring that our students are prepared for their global futures regardless of field and whether it's in global California or anywhere in the world. With that, please join me in welcoming President Jane Close Connolly. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm so glad to welcome you to the fourth annual Elena Diane Curris Lecture on Global Issues. Uh, as Richard said, we're honored to have members of the Curris family with us tonight. Dino, Joe, mom and dad, Dino, Joe, sister-in-law, Bobby, Aunt Alice is there. So we're really happy to have a chance to reconnect with all of you. Um, Elena, as some of you know very well, because I recognize you in the audience, was a longtime member of our University Relations and Development Division. Uh, her many friends and colleagues, both on campus and off campus, uh, really admired Elena's zest for adventure, her compassion, her kindness, and her boundless curiosity about the world. That's what really impressed so many people. Through the creation of this endowed lecture series, many more people will be exposed to the kinds of issues and ideas that so interested Elena. And we hope that this will in turn foster greater enthusiasm for, understanding of, and sensitivity to global issues. Now, Elena was also known for having a kind of wicked sense of humor. She was very quick to laugh. So I feel very certain that she would have been particularly happy and enjoyed hearing from tonight's speaker, the wonderful comedian and actor, Maz Jobrani. Uh, and particularly about his experiences living as an Iranian immigrant in the United States. CSULB, as people from CSULB know, is one of the most diverse campuses in our nation, has a significant population of immigrants from around the world. These students have often expressed um, kind of different and more complex perspectives and experiences of global competency, diversity, and immigration. And Maz Jabrani helps us try to make sense of these challenges through his comedy. I think we can all agree that the need for global understanding and competence is perhaps more important than ever. 
It is important, of course, that our students develop, as Richard mentioned, the knowledge and life skills needed to live in today's interconnected world. But they also need to cultivate attitudes and understanding that will allow them, in the words of Dr. Ariel Tichner Wagner, to participate as empathic, engaged, and effective citizens of the world. So Joe, Dino, Bobby, and Alice, we're so glad uh, to be working with you to honor Elena's memory uh, by empowering others to act thoughtfully and creatively on issues of global significance. Thank you for entrusting this responsibility uh, to us, in part. And thanks to everyone who came out this evening. I'm delighted to see you all and hope that you, I know you'll have a great time. And now it's my honor to uh, welcome Dino Curris to the stage. Um. Well, friends, on behalf of the family of Elena Diane Curris, who've been introduced, and her several friends that are here tonight, I bring greetings. In establishing the annual Elena Curris Global Issues Lecture, we sought in conjunction with the Global in Studies Institute and the 49er Foundation to honor our daughter's legacy, as well as to promote global awareness and human understanding, both on campus and in the larger community. The three previous annual lectures provided incisive presentations on human rights, the arts, and diplomacy. Tonight, we turn to a timely, and as has been suggested, a prospectively humorous perspective on immigration in America, a topic I might add as President Conley pointed out, that our daughter Elena, with her wry sense of humor uh, and with two immigrant grandparents, would heartily applaud. We are delighted with the planning committee's selection of Maz Jobrani to be this year's speaker, and we look forward to his presentation. The family of Elena Diane Curris joins the university in welcoming you this evening. Thank you, Dino. Uh, I have the great honor of introducing tonight's speaker, uh, Maz Jobrani. Uh, many of you know him uh, from his, uh, his Netflix comedy special, Immigrant, uh, fall, uh, filmed at the, at the Kennedy Center. Uh, from his TV credits, uh, Superior Donuts, Grey's Anatomy, Curb Your Enthusiasm, True Blood, Last Man Standing, Shameless, and others. Um, he's also the author of an LA Times best-selling book, I'm Not a Terrorist, But I've Played One on TV. <laughs> uh, Maz was a founding member of the Axis of Evil comedy tour and is a regular panelist uh, on NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, and he's given two TED Talks. Uh, with that, please join me in welcoming Maz Jobrani. Hey, hello! Long Beach! Thank you, Richard. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Jane. Uh, thank you to the Kurz family. Thank you so much for having me as part of this. Hi. You're waving at me. Hi. Thank you. How are you? Good to see you. That's the Persians. How are you? The Persians are here. What's up? Um, thank you all for coming out. I hope you all washed your hands 20 times today, at least. At least. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm really uh, honored to get a chance to do this. I usually do stand-up, but um, I got a chance to give a talk, so this is kind of cool, because I had actually wanted to be a professor, but I dropped out of a PhD program. So uh, if any of you are in a PhD program, you can drop out and be a comedian. So <laughs> that's lesson number one for today's lecture. Uh, but no, uh, when I got a chance to uh, uh, have lunch with you today and learn a little bit about Elena, I, uh, I was honored to get a chance to be the speaker with you here today. And the, and the title I gave of this talk is Growing Up an Immigrant in America. Uh, who, who, who's grown up an immigrant in America? Anybody here? There we go. My people, yes. All right. Are you guys Iranian as well? Or what, what are you, what's, what's your background? Yeah. Mexican, oh, fantastic. Yeah, same color flag, so. Yeah. 
There you go. You get a wall, we get a travel ban. So there you go. <laughs> it's all going to work out. Uh, yeah, this is not just a lecture. It's going to be crowd work as well. Um, uh, no, but, but uh, I, so I was trying to think about what it's like. Were you, were you, were you born in America or were you born in Mexico? Yeah, born in Mexico. Are, are you Persian? You look like, are you? I'm Algerian. Algerian. Oh, and were you born in Algeria? Born here, okay. Throw your parents under the bus. That's good. Okay. Um, no, well, I was also born. I was born in Iran, and I was trying to think about this this topic of growing up an immigrant in America, and and I, I realized kind of three big struggles that I had throughout my life growing up America uh, as as, a, as an immigrant, as an Iranian immigrant in America. The three big challenges. One was trying to blend in. So it came from like trying to blend in with the outside. Uh, the, the second big challenge was from the inside. Was my family trying to become an individual and ultimately disappoint my family. Um, yeah, they didn't want this. Uh, yeah, the community didn't want Nobody wanted this. Um, but, and the third challenge for me going into Hollywood was then, uh, again, from the outside, trying to, trying to see the representation that we have in Hollywood. So I'll tell you a little bit about my story. We came in late 1978. Uh, and uh, back then, there was protests in the streets of Iran. And my father was on business in, uh, in New York. And at the time, uh, there was a two-week winter break that we had. Uh, schools were shut down because of the protests, and it was, it was cold. And my father told my mom, he said, why don't you bring uh, me and my sister and come over for two weeks, and uh, the protests will quiet down, uh, and you guys can go back. Uh, because in the past, the Shah, who was the leader of Iran at the time, had squashed other protests. And uh, they thought, my parents thought that will happen again. Well, uh, we came, and I always say we came for two weeks, and we stayed for 42 years, um, <laughs> which is pretty common with a lot of Iranians I run into. They all say, yeah, we, were, we just got our luggage and we left, um, which is something that I try to remind people whenever I talk about being an immigrant, because as you all know right now, the word immigrant sometimes uh, has taken a negative connotation. And I just want to remind people that people that are coming to this country most of the time are coming to do good in this country and a lot of the time are fleeing a bad situation, whether it's Syria or Central America or wherever it is. No one's in a great situation going, oh wow, we have uh, uh, our, our jobs and we speak the language and everything's fantastic. Let's go to a country that doesn't want us. We don't speak the language. Let's go try it out. <laughs> so that's why I really sympathize with immigrants. Uh, you know, when the whole thing happened with uh, the travel ban and a lot of Syrians uh, that were fleeing that war, uh, were not allowed in, and of course Iranians were in the travel ban, a lot of countries were in the travel ban. I actually went down to LAX and I protested. I don't know if any of you guys, have you guys did, have you, did you guys protest at all? You were there? Yes! Guys, more of you should do it. It's a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> listen, no, protesting, was, it, was, it was amazing because I was worried at first going down to protest, but I felt like I was doing something when I finally ended up down there. And uh, one of the things that I did say, I, I talk about this in my special, my comedy special, is when you go to a protest, you realize that people of color and other people not born in America protest differently than white people born in America. Because <laughs> we were all protesting, we were all marching, everything was going great, and then the riot police came out and I was like, oh snap, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna go protest over here for a minute. <laughs> but the white guys did not care, they just kept going, out of my way, copper, it's my right. My Third Amendment, my Eighth Amendment, my 45th Amendment. I'm in the back. There's 45 amendments? But I actually saw a white guy with his finger in the face of the riot police, and the guy was going for his baton, and I was in the back freaking out. I'm like, calm down, white guy. You're going to get us all in trouble. But it was true because it, I was worried. You know how worried I was to actually go protest? I'm not making this up. I actually took my passport to the protest. That's how worried I was because of like the insecurity that I have in my head, you know? So as I said, when I came from uh, Iran to America, uh, we were, I was always trying to blend in. One of the things that happened, my father was a successful businessman in Iran, so he was staying at the Plaza Hotel uh, across the street from FAO Schwartz. We were talking about that today at, uh, at our lunch, and FAO Schwartz is, if you guys know the movie Big, it's where they have that piano on the ground and they're dancing with Tom Hanks, remember we were talking about that? It's a, it, the younger people. Have you seen? Have you seen Big? No, you guys should see Big. Have you seen Big? Big's a great. Yeah, a lot of people don't. That yeah, it's crazy. I feel out of touch. Um, no, Big's a great. It's like 13 going on 30. You know what 13 going on 30 is? Am I getting closer? Anyone? Um, so, hello, welcome. How are you guys? Thank you for coming. Hi. How are you? 
he's from Mexico and he's Algerian and <laughs> I'm Iranian. How are you? Nice to see you. Welcome. You got lost. It's a big campus. Don't worry about it. Yeah, it is. What's that? Yeah, who knows about this? I didn't know about this auditorium. Yeah, there you go. Where are you guys from? Where are your background? Egypt. Is that your kabibti? Yalla. That's all I know. Um, and where, where are you? Iranian, there you go. Iran and Egypt together. Fantastic. Oh, my God. Yeah, you guys had a revolution. We had a revolution. Yeah, I'm not going back. Uh, so I'm telling them the story of when we first came to America. My father is staying at the Plaza Hotel. He's a businessman. Across the street is FAO Schwartz. I get to go there with my mom and my sister. We go buy toys. And we're like, you know, it's, it's the longest break ever. And I'm a six-year-old. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, this revolution is really working out for me. <laughs> Um, and things were going fine until, uh, you know, um, we ended up, um, we, we, you know, moving to Northern California, Marin County. And here's the thing about being Iranian in America is we have not gotten out of the news for 42 years. <laughs> it is nonstop. I mean, I don't care. Like, even Mexicans, sometimes you take a break, you know. <laughs> you know, Egypt, sometimes Americans don't forget. They're like pyramids. That's all they know. But Iranians, you get up to every few years, like we, ha I don't know, we're like, we got we, our publicist, whoever it is, <laughs> done a great job keeping us in the news. I'm telling you, as soon as we landed, I'm a little kid, I'm like, oh, America, this is really cool, all right, you know, we've left Iran, we're here, there's a revolution, we're going to get a new life, and then the hostage crisis happens. Now, for some of you in your 20s, there was something called the hostage crisis. Um, a lot of 20-year-olds don't know this, but every night on ABC television, there was a guy named Ted Koppel, and he was counting down the days of the hostage crisis. Every night, it was like day 122, day 123, day 124, and I'd be at home watching, becoming less Iranian every day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and so the hostage crisis happened, and it was crazy because I always say this. I think, uh, you know, in, in World War II, Japanese Americans were put into internment camps. They were, they were the enemy suddenly. Well, similarly to them, Iranians, we had immigrated, leaving that government, you know, against that government, come to this country. They took the hostages, but the closest that Americans could find to beat people up were us. So they started, we would, they would beat you up back then, for we weren't even involved, we were like on, on their side, but they would beat you up and they would call you effing Iranians, not effing, they would actually say the word. And um, I never got beaten up, but I got called an effing Iranian when I was in the fourth grade. There was a sixth grader who would call me effing Iranian, and I didn't know what to say because he was bigger than me. You know what I'm gonna be like, oh yeah, well you're an effing American. Uh, <laughs> that's not cool then, you know, uh, I'm just telling him where he's from. Uh, there was actually a black kid in the fifth grade who helped me out. He put his arm around me. He's like, let's take a walk, man. Listen, I've been dealing with this crap for 200 years. Um, <laughs> this is what you got to do. You either got to be a comedian or go see a therapist. So I became a comedian and uh, it disappointed everybody. Um, no, but, uh, but, but that was, so that was the hostage crisis. You know, right when you start getting through that, suddenly this thing happens called the Iran-Contra scandal. It's kind of like the Ukrainian thing that just happened, but with Iran and, and Contras and uh, Nicaragua. And uh, so then we were still in the news. Then uh, a movie came out called Not Without My Daughter. Who remembers Not Without My Daughter? Yeah, everybody from, oh my God. For those of you people in college, this movie, it was called Not Without My Daughter. It was with Sally Field and an actor named Alfred Molina. And it was based on a true story. But the problem was we already had such a negative image in Western media that we didn't need this movie. And let me just summarize the movie. The movie was Sally Field's an American woman. She marries an Iranian man. They're living in, I think, Michigan. And he's the nicest guy in the world. I think his name was Mahmoud, but they called him Mood. And so they're like on a picnic, and he's like, I love you, you know, this is fantastic, life is great. And they go, let's go back to Iran. And as soon as they go back to Iran, the guy changes like that, and he's going like, you will not leave this country without my daughter, uh, with my daughter, you know, I will kill you and sacrifice you like a sheep. And I'm watching this, I'm like, this is not good for us. <laughs> and, and I'm like, wow, his name was Mood, there's a reason, now he's moody, you know. <laughs> But the problem with that movie was, again, American audiences might have gone and watched it. You guys are going, oh, whatever, what a, you know, what a dramatic movie, fantastic. But for Iranians, we're watching going, oh, my God, we don't need this. And in all honesty, it was crazy because this happened around the time I was late, later in high school, uh, early college. And a lot of my Iranian friends, especially guys in general, 
they just were like, I don't want anything to do with this. So they all started pretending to be Italian. Because, no, because if you were Iranian, they would think, oh, you're the guy from Not Without My Daughter. So all my friends, like Mahmoud became Tony. And uh, <laughs> it's much easier being Tony. It's much easier. Um, so that was that. So then we had that. I mean, we just, we would not get out of the news. Um, then uh, we also, even when it wasn't us, we ended up in the news. September 11th was not Iranians. But somehow, we ended up in the axis of evil. And I remember watching, and George, and George Bush said, there's an axis of evil. I was like, yes, there is. And he's like, it's North Korea. I go, preach on. And he goes, it's Iraq. I go, right on. And he goes, it's Iran. I go, what the hell? <laughs> How did we end up in this? But we're constant, constant. And I'll tell you personal uh, experiences. You know, like um, one time when I was in high school in Northern California, I was with a group of friends. And it was a mixed group of friends. It was... Uh, you know, uh, white, uh, African-American, uh, you know, couple of Persian guys, this, that, the other. And we're all, we all walked into this late night diner with like 10, 15 high school kids. And one of the kids who was a, an Iranian kid was speaking Persian to, the, to another kid. And as we walked in, some big, big grown adult, big guy heard us talking and just turned around and started yelling at us. He said, this is America, speak American. And I'm like, well, first of all, it's English, but that's fine. Uh, <laughs> And he wanted to fight us because we were speaking Persian. And, and, and come to find out, like, we, you know, after, after the police came and made the guy leave, we found out that this guy was like some former boxer and he was just out of his mind. But it's just crazy to confront somebody like that because you're going, what, we're just speaking another language. Why are you afraid of another language? Uh, or after September 11th, my own mother had situations where, you know, I blend in a little bit because I don't have an accent. So if you don't know who I am, you might see me and go, oh, maybe he's Latino, maybe he's Middle Eastern, maybe he's just tan. Um, <laughs> my mom, though, has the accent and she talks like this very much. You can tell she's from somewhere. And so, <laughs> yeah. So I, this actually happened. After September 11th, she was at a Costco and she was trying to get some groceries and there was a cart that was in her way. So she moves the cart to get to her groceries. And um, this lady comes back and asks my mom, she goes, who moved my cart? And my mom says, I did, it was in my way, I had to get to my items. And then the lady says, uh, right away, the lady says, well, why don't you go back to your country? Right away. And my mom says, this is my country. Um, and then the lady supposedly took her cart and started walking away and turned to my mom and goes, bitch, to my mom. And my mom uh, thinks of herself, she likes to present herself as a lady, I'm very much a lady, she would never cuss. So she told me, she says, I told her, I said, uh, she who says it, is it. <laughs> wow. Uh, uh, that's great, Mom. <laughs> I think I said that in kindergarten, but that's great. <laughs> so you have real life things happening. Again, this is being an immigrant in America, because I think one thing that, again, a lot of people don't understand, like I said, I always encourage people, I go get to know immigrants, go to their restaurants, realize that they're trying to do good and they do good. We add a lot to this country. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't know our experiences. And this is an Iranian American experience. I'm sure Mexican American, Algerian American, I'm sure everybody's got their own set of experiences. But it feels like Iran just, it just keeps going. You know, after uh, September 11th, then you see the travel ban. And I'm going, again, I'm going, my gosh. And, and one of the problems with the travel ban that I had is that it was sold as an idea to keep terrorists out of this country, but no one from any of the countries in the travel ban had ever committed an act of terror in America. And so you go, I don't know. I mean, what's going on? And, and, and the unfortunate thing, again, as an Iranian American is I also feel for Iranians in Iran. A lot of young people in Iran don't have the opportunities. There's a lack of freedoms there. There's a lot of oppression going on there. But by putting the travel ban on these young people, and you guys know at the university level, a lot of students come from there to study here. But all of a sudden, now we're not letting them come here. And they're you know, being oppressed over there. So it's heartbreaking. Um, so it's constant. And then this year, earlier this year, we saw almost going to war. That was crazy. I know every Iranian I know was on edge uh, earlier on this year. That was just two months ago. Can you believe that? And it was the, the, the one interesting thing was I had a lot of my American friends, as soon as they, they killed the general, uh, my American friends were calling me up going, are you okay? And I was like, I go, why? They go, we killed the general. I go, he wasn't my uncle. <laughs> you know? <laughs> And one thing I will say, one thing I will say is one good thing about America going to war with any country is that Americans learn how to say the name of the country. Because the Iranians here know what I'm talking about. One of my biggest pet peeves is when my American friends call it Iran. And I'm like, it's not Iran. It's not Iran. You know, they go, are you from Iran? I go, are you from America? 
So when you almost go to war, people go, oh, it's Iran. I go, yes, like the letter E and a guy named Ron. So that's uh, uh, the other thing that's actually very entertaining for us Middle Easterners is, and I'm sure sometimes Latinos too, is watching sometimes the polit American politicians or news people mispronounce our names. So like any time, like when they got the guy, the ISIS guy, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. I don't know if you remember that, and Trump was announcing that, and he, he, he got to the name, he goes, today we killed the leader of ISIS, and then he just kind of stopped, he's Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. And I'm watching, I go, is he having a stroke? What's going on? And then when they got this guy, General Soleimani, the Iranian general, I was watching, it was uh, some news, news uh, outlet was, was talking about him. They kept calling him General Salami. And I was like, no, he's not a deli meat, man. Um, I actually think that whenever politicians or news people are going to say our names, they should have one of our people standing on the side, some guy named Abdullah. And when they get to the name, just be like, Abdullah, come here. He's like, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. And then he just comes over here. So... <laughs> So that's kind of been the struggle with trying to blend in because it's like no matter how much you try to lay low, even now with this coronavirus thing, Iran is one of the nations that's got the most number. It's crazy. I'm like, I, I, I swear to you, you don't even know. I have American stand-up comedian friends of mine who go through none of this. They just, they're like, whatever. I got to tell them. I go, did you know we almost went to war with Iran? They go, what? What's up? You know? So it's been crazy with Iran, one thing after the next. And even now, it's crazy. Like, it, I mean, this is serious stuff that happens. But I'm just saying from the standpoint of someone who's trying to perform in this world, you know, you get caught in the middle of it a lot. So that's been dealing with the external world. Then we have our internal world, which is the struggles of, of trying to, the challenge of, of, of dealing with our families. And Iranians, I think Indians, I think a lot of Asian families have this. I think immigrant families in general, our families are pretty overbearing and they kind of, like, they plan what they want for us, you know, to do. And like I was saying, lawyer, doctor, engineer, that's it. Like, when I did this, I had to rebel against my dad. I rebelled against my mom. I rebelled against the community. I started doing this 21 years ago, and I don't think anyone in the community was doing this at, back then. And I could hear people talking behind our backs. You know, they'd be like, did you hear about Joe Brani's son? He is almost a drug dealer. Um, <laughs> that's what this was to them. Um, so... So for me, you know, I grew up in America since I was six years old. I, I would watch cartoons. I would watch Bugs Bunny. I would watch Woody Wood, Woodpecker, all that stuff. And then, and then I get a little bit older, and Eddie Murphy. And Eddie Murphy comes on the scene, and um, he was the rock star back then. He was kind of like the Kevin Hart of now or whatever. And so for me, that was my guy. And I thought to myself, I want to be like Eddie Murphy. I want to be a comedian. So what I did was, and I encourage parents now, and I, I know there's some young, young children here, I encourage parents to get your kids to do plays, do musicals. It's the best thing. Even if they don't end up going into a career at, at, with, with performing, they learn to be comfortable in front of a crowd. And I just had my son in the sixth grade do his first uh, play, and it was beautiful, and he was just hamming it up, and I was so proud of him. Um, but I remember when I was... Uh, in the seventh grade, I tried out for a play. It was called The Boyfriend. It was a musical. And I was one of the backup dancers and singers. And, and, and that was it. And, and, the, and the director back then, her name was Shirley Bombright. And she had told us, she said, when you're doing a musical, you have to always be smiling. When you're dancing, always be smiling. And I think coming from an immigrant family, it actually worked to my advantage. Because when you come from an immigrant family, the lesson your immigrant parents teach you is shut up and listen to us. And that's it. Don't talk back. Whereas a lot of my non-immigrant friends would talk back to their parents, which was weird. I'd never seen anything like that. And I remember because my mom, when I was a kid, it was allowed to hit. They were allowed to hit. So they would hit you. So I remember if I talked back, I would get hit. Then one time I was at my friend's house, Jesse, and Jesse's still one of my best friends. Do Mexican parents hit you? You get did you, Algerian parents? Of course. Yeah, it's, it's fine. <laughs> Listen, I was at Jesse's house. I'm not kidding. We were like 10 or 11 or something, and, and Jesse said something, uh, um, and, and his mom said something like, Jesse, clean your room or something, and he told her like, well, mom, you know, shut up or whatever, and then she goes, oh, Jesse, you're ridiculous, and she walked away, and, and I, <laughs> I turned to Jesse. I go, is that it? He goes, that's it. I go, really? I go, she's not getting a weapon? Are we okay? It was crazy. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, so, so that was like, uh, 
So immigrant parents, like I said, very strict, right? And they want certain things. But because of that, I think I learned to listen to my elders. Don't question your elders. So when Shirley Bombright, the director of the musical, says, always smile when you dance, I learned always smile when I'm dancing. So one day I showed up at rehearsals, and I, I was sick. And I went up to Mrs. Bo Ms. Bombright. I said, Ms. Bombright, uh, I'm a little under the weather, but I still came today, and I'll be here. She goes, great, get up on that stage. So I'm up on the stage, and again, I'm one of the background singers. I'm not I'm dancers. I'm not even in the front, but I'm smiling and dancing. And I think the other kids, because they weren't as afraid of authority, I think they were just kind of dancing without smiling. And so Shirley Bombright stopped the whole rehearsal. Stop, everybody stop, stop. And I'm looking around. I'm going, what's going on? And then she goes, look at him. Look at it. And she's pointing at me. And I go, what did I do? And she goes, he's sick, and he came, and he's smiling. You should all learn from him. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm good at this. Um, <laughs> so that was the beginning of me realizing that, wow, I could actually kind of do this. And I love being on stage. And I loved being on stage. And it was interesting because my uh, parents would come to my shows sometimes. And they would come backstage, and the director would say, listen, your son actually has what it takes to do this. And my parents, my dad and mom, oh, thank you, thank you very much. And then we'd get in the car, and my dad would be like, that bitch is crazy. Um, <laughs> you, are not, you are not doing that. <laughs> so that was it. So that was, that's kind of my path. I mean, it became a struggle with my parents. I mean, they just kept pushing me in another direction. And, and then I went to undergrad, and they said, you should be a lawyer. So I thought I should be a lawyer. My mom even would tell me, she said, listen, just become a lawyer, and you can just do jokes in court. And <laughs> I was I don't know, Mom. Uh, so so I, go to, I go to undergrad, study political science, thinking that maybe I'll then go to law school. Then my junior year, I go to Italy to study abroad in Italy. And I've been telling every, I tell everybody who's in college, study abroad for a year. Go for a year. Go. Yeah. Not, not now, but you know, when the virus is. <laughs> give it a month or two, but go. Uh, no, it's amazing. It was the best year of my life. I, I really, besides learning Italian and all that good stuff, I, I really, you get a perspective on the world. And you grow as an individual more than you ever think you will. And it was also another form of rebellion for me against my parents, because they had, again, immigrant parents, they wanted me to stay close, but I went. And it was great. While I was there, there was this professor, his name was Vincenzo Pace, and, uh, and, and he was this professor of, uh, it was, uh, of political science and sociology, and, and I took a class called The Sociology of Religion. And this guy was just really cool. He had a goatee, and he had the blazer with even the little patch. <laughs> And he had a gold pocket watch. And he would stand there every morning every, at every, uh, before the class. And he'd open up the pocket watch. And he would watch it tick down. And then, he, and then when class would start, he'd close it. And he'd say, allora, momento, which meant uh, uh, now. Let's talk about Muhammad or whatever that was. And I was like, wow, that's cool. And I thought, that's what I want to do. So I decided I want to be a professor. And I thought that was a good compromise between my parents wanting me to have a reputable job that they could go to parties and show off to their friends about, um, and me being in front of an audience. I thought that could work. So I came back to America. I told my mom, I go, listen, I'm going to be a professor. She's like, professor? They don't get paid anything. Um, I don't know, maybe here. But <laughs> uh, she didn't want professor. But I convinced her I'm going to be a professor. Uh, so I was going to be a, I, I started a PhD program uh, for political science at UCLA. And right away, I realized that's not what I wanted to do. I snuck over to the theater department and started getting on stage again. And this is me, again, rebelling against my family, you know, this, this, this challenge of the in, inside, coming from the inside the family. And I think this is an issue we have growing up immigrant in America, because I think a lot of families who are you know, uh, uh, evolved in that kind of way. They encourage their kids, go for it, do what you want. But our families, immigrant families, are like, you do what I want. Um, you know, your dream is, I'll tell you what your dream is. <laughs> so I was doing plays at the theater, and I decided, you know what, I'm going to drop out. First year, dropped out of PSC program. Went to my mom. I said, listen, I'm going to drop. I'm going to go be an actor. And my mom was, now she was really freaking out. She's like, you did not become a lawyer. You did not become a professor. At least become a mechanic. I said, how'd you go from lawyer to mechanic? There's a lot of jobs in between. And she goes, no, listen, uh, people need mechanics. Nobody needs a comedian. Nobody needs, <laughs> nobody needs an actor. And she was right. You don't need a comedian or actor. You do need someone to fix your car. Um, but I realized, again, uh, that's the immigrant mentality, because she had had her life flipped upside down. So in the back of her mind 
when a revolution happens in America, you can go to Argentina and fix cars. So that was her practical you know, uh, advice. And you know, so uh, that, was, that was what my parents had been pushing me towards. Uh, but then I, then I left the graduate program, got a job in advertising for a little bit. And again, I'll take a second to tell any students that are here to don't freak out if you get lost in your ways when you're in your early 20s. Uh, there's, it's not a ticking clock. Find what you love doing. You know, I've met so many people that are successful now who say, I got lost in my ways and I went and tended bar for a while and then I worked here, I worked there. Uh, I have a podcast right now called Back to School with Maz Jobrani and I just interviewed uh, Dr. Pimple Popper. You guys know Dr. Pimple Popper? You know what I'm talking about? If you haven't seen it, it's a show on TLC. She was a dermatologist and she just started putting these, these uh, videos of her patients where she would be getting rid of pimples online. And then she became this celebrity. Now she's got a TV show, but she told me her story. She said that when she tried to go to medical school, she was not accepted to any medical school. So she had a year to kind of hang out. And so she said, I took all kinds of odd jobs and it was one of the best years of my life. And I'm seeing more and more kids uh, in their uh, teenage years, early 20s, freak out when something like that happens. And I'm here to tell you, don't freak out. In the long run, you're gonna find success, you'll get there. So if something happens and you're not sure you wanna, I, I changed careers four or five times. And, and I ended up in this advertising agency, still trying to figure out how to get the acting career going. And it wasn't until I was 26 years old, I was working in the advertising agency, I was doing theater on the side, and I, and I was making a copy of the video. Uh, we had a thing called VHS videotapes back then. <laughs> I was making a copy of that video and there was an older gentleman at the advertising agency. His name was Joe Ryan, and Joe was in his 60s at the time. And he watched uh, the, a little bit of the play and he goes, hey, you're pretty funny. Have you thought about doing this for a career? And I said, Joe, you know, my uh, junior high teacher told me I should do it. My high school teacher told me I should do it. My parents told me I shouldn't do it. But I said, I'm trying to save up some money and when I'm in my 30s, I'm gonna try and be a professional comedian and actor. And he said, Let, come into my office for a second. And he sat me down. He was in his 60s. And he goes, listen, there were some things I wanted to do when I was in my 20s, but I never got around to doing it. So he goes, if you really want to do it, if it's really in you, go for it. And I was 26. That was a light bulb moment. I enrolled in a stand-up comedy class, and I've been going since. So that was 21, 22 years ago. So that's another piece of advice I'll give anybody here. Even if you're older and you have things you wanted to do, don't wait. I mean, that's for me too. Like, I, I still, I've been wanting to take piano lessons forever, and uh, I think I'm going to start tomorrow. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that was the the struggle with my family. Now, the third challenge that I had was once I got into Hollywood, and that was a new challenge that I'd not expected because uh, growing up, the plays I would do. When you do plays in high school and in college, you get to play all kinds of characters. So when I was in high school, we had a play where I got to be Batman. It was awesome. And then I got to do, uh, I, I, there was a musical called Little Abner, and he's from the country. And I got to play a guy from the country. And I was like, this is fantastic. I can go to Hollywood and play all these parts, and maybe one day I'll be James Bond. Um, and you show up, and they go, oh, you're Middle Eastern. Great. Can you say, I will kill you in the name of Allah? Uh, <laughs> you go, I could, but what if I played the doctor? And they go, great. Then you can hijack the hospital. Um, <laughs> So early on, I started running into these uh, types of roles. And, uh, and actually, the I'll be honest, the, the first role I got actually was to play a security guard in a TV show called Chicago Hope. This is a side note. Security guard, no ethnicity, just the guy. And I had a great scene with an actor named Hector Elizondo, who if you guys saw Pretty Woman, he's the, again, you guys don't know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> he's, he's this actor, if you see him, you'll know him. He was in a lot of movies. And Hector Elizondo was great, we had a great scene. And right around that time was when we had our 10 year high school reunion. And I remember I was so excited that I had this great scene in a TV show that was a, you know, a big show on CBS at the time. So I go to my high school reunion and everyone says, hey, what are you up to? I go, oh, well, you know, I got a job in an ad agency, but you know, I'm, I'm gonna be on TV, give me your email, I'll let you know when. And so I got everybody's email, I got everybody I knew, I got ready, I was in touch with the production office for this TV show. I said, let me know when it's gonna air, I'm gonna tell, I got all my friends, they're gonna watch it, 
And what, what, what it was was I had one big scene with Hector Elizondo as a security guard, and then they had two or three scenes where I'm closing the doors just as establishing scenes to know that I'm the security guard. Well, after I sent out the email and told the whole world to watch, the guy from the production office called and said, listen, we have to cut the scene for timing, but we kept the opening door scene. <laughs> I swear to God, every one of my friends were leaving voice messages going, dude, I have a party. Can you be the security guard? <laughs> so welcome to Hollywood. Uh, but then after that, the, the terrorist type role starts coming in. And, and I'm, I'm early in my career. I don't know better. And I think that I should take any parts that I get, because that'll be a stepping stone. So I get a part in a Chuck Norris movie of the week. And you know, when you're a Middle Eastern actor in a Chuck Norris movie of the week, you know what you're going to be doing. Uh, you're going to be dying. Uh, so I was playing, uh, this was before September 11th. They did, a, they did kind of a play off of um, almost like a uh, uh, bin Laden type character. I was playing an Afghan terrorist, a physicist who's working with Afghan terrorists who comes to Chicago to blow up a building in Chicago. And I took the part, this is how stupid I am, I was like, maybe through my acting, I will show why he's doing what he's doing. I'll be such a good thespian, the audience will understand that I've had a tragedy in the past and I'm now taking it out on America. Well, I showed up at the wardrobe fitting, this was filmed in Dallas at the time, they flew me in, I go to the wardrobe fitting and the lady goes, here's your shirt, here's your pants, here's your turban. And I go, oh, I go, no, no, Afghans in America don't wear turbans. I go, Indian Sikhs wear turbans. And she was like, dude, this is a Chuck Norris movie. Uh, <laughs> you're wearing a turban. And I said, no. I said, listen, I've done my research. Let the producers know I shouldn't be wearing a turban. I'm serious. You know, I'll get this. Let's get it right. So the next day I showed up in my trailer. There was my shirt. There's my pants. And there's a scarf. And I said, oh, see? I said, you talk to them? And they let you have me wear a scarf. I said, I will gladly be the scarf-wearing terrorist. And she goes, that's not a scarf, that's a turban. You've got to roll it back up. Uh, so I did it. I felt like an idiot. Um, and I, uh, I, I, uh, I came back to Los Angeles. I told my agents, I said, no more terrorist parts. I'm done with it. And then the TV show 24 called. And they said, we have a terrorist part. I said, no. And then they said, but he changes his mind halfway through the mission. I go, aha, uh -huh, the ambivalent terrorist. <laughs> I go, now we're talking. <laughs> and if you ever watch season two of 24, you'll see me. I'm driving this truck around with these two other terrorists. We have a nuclear bomb in the back. As we're driving around, I look outside. I see some kids playing. I have a change of heart. So I turn to the other terrorists, and I'm like, guys, do we really have to kill people? And they take out a, uh, take out a gun, and they shoot me. And <laughs> I'm like, guys, I'm just trying to start a conversation here. <laughs> so that was... The last time I played a terrorist, and then after that I said, no more terrorist parts, and uh, I haven't worked since. Um, <laughs> so, no, actually, that's another piece of advice I'll give the young people here, is no is a good word sometimes. Sometimes telling people no when it comes to, uh, you know, jobs and stuff is good, because if you really don't feel it in your bones and in your heart, say no. Because once I started saying no to those parts, I was able to move on and do the parts that I wanted to do. To this day, I don't mind playing a deli, you know, a falafel stand owner or a cab driver or whatever, because the truth is, when I'm in New York City or some big cities, a lot of times the guys that are doing those things are of Middle Eastern descent. I've seen those guys, I know those guys. The terrorist thing is the thing that really, to me, is, is a no-go, uh, because the fact is, I mean, I travel the world now doing stand-up, and I meet a lot of good people from Middle Eastern descent, whether it's Egyptian, Iranian, Algerian, I don't care where you're from, Middle Eastern, North African descent, and they're good people. And so to be represented that way is, is heartbreaking. So uh, I've tried as much as I can now to kind of uh, lead my career the way I want to lead it. Uh, and again, I will tell you guys to take, take charge of, of your own image, whatever you do, whether you end up being writers or artists or engineers or whatever it is. You know, you get to present yourself how you want. And I've had a chance now to do five comedy specials. My next, my tour that I have going right now, it's called the Peaceful Warrior Tour. And uh, a reason I named it that is because I'm just trying to be somewhat politically active, but do it in a peaceful way as much as I can. Um, because the truth is we all know the world is divided right now. And I've done shows before where people got upset when I was doing jokes about the president. And I had to remind them, I said, the point of America is we should be able to make fun of our leaders, whether it's Democrat, Republican, doesn't matter. Uh, because, as you know, I couldn't make fun of the president of Iran in Iran. 
If I, if I did that, you'd say, hey, when's your next show? I'd be like, there are no more shows. Um, <laughs> the Ministry of No Show showed up. Uh, but no, I, I, I had an issue where I was doing some jokes and, and somebody got upset that I was doing jokes about the president and, and, and then I got into an argument with them and I realized, you know what, that's not getting us anywhere. So now I just try to Tai Chi the whole thing and if they are yelling at me, I go, this is fantastic. We live in a country where you can have your opinion, I can have my opinion and I encourage you to go out and, and express your opinion. You know, start a blog, become a comedian, write a movie, whatever it is, but just do it, right? So um, with that said, uh, one last message. I hope you all voted. Uh, if not, try and get it done uh, and just be politically active. And, uh, and that's it. I'm Maz Jabrani. Now, uh, I'd like to open up the... Uh, uh, to questions, anybody's got any questions, uh, and I will answer those for as long as you guys want. Um, and uh, and go ahead and raise your hand. They have microphones, and uh, don't be shy. I don't bite, and I can answer anything. If you have any questions about, um, uh, you know, uh, coronavirus, I got answers. Um, <laughs> there's someone in the back there. All right. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. It was great. Sure, thank you. Um, so I'm curious, um, since you ended by talking a little bit about the stereotypes of Middle Eastern, people of Middle Eastern descent in Hollywood, what are some of the stories that you wish were being told in movies and in television about people from that part of the world who have immigrated to the US? What do you think would be a yeah, great story? Yeah, you know, I think, I think a big thing is, a lot, of, a lot of people ask me about this, and they go, why aren't there more people from these backgrounds in Hollywood? I think, I think what happens is, that the first, uh, when, when immigrants come to America, they set up shop and they do whatever business it is and their hope is to get their kids into colleges or whatever and have them go on into these doctor, lawyer type of uh, occupations. But I think it takes the second or third generation to realize, oh wow, we can do stuff in the arts. And so I was early on with that and now I'm happy to, to, to know that in this world, there's a lot of comedians that are, we'll say brown comedians. There's a lot of Indian comedians and, and Arab comedians and Iranian comedians, and numbers have grown. And there's a lot of uh, filmmakers and storytellers from those backgrounds, and it's, it's amazing. I'm currently in an in a, uh, in, in independent film. It's called uh, A Simple Wedding, and the writer is an Iranian-American girl named Sara Zandia, and she wrote this, this movie, and um, uh, Rita Wilson's in it. Uh, and it's basically like a uh, uh, big fat Greek wedding, but with Iranians. Uh, but it's a smaller film because you know we're just we don't have necessarily the 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 backing to go out and do big stuff yet. Um, I also personally have been trying to sell some TV show ideas. Um, and again, I think I think what could really help us get our stories across is when we get more and more people that are executives in these positions. Because sometimes you go to tell your story and the executive doesn't quite get it. But when you have someone that has a similar experience, they're going to get it and they're going to understand that other people will get it. One of the things I've been able to do as a stand-up comedian, it's almost like I'm focus grouping every night. I travel all over the world and I travel all over America. And, and I refuse to accept, for the longest times, I think a lot of the networks would use the excuse that middle America is not going to get it. And I would say, no, you guys are underestimating middle America. And, and especially if we tell stories that are common stories. So you watch a TV show like Blackish, it happens to be an African American family, but I've talked to a lot of people from different backgrounds who love that show. So I think it's just people taking some risks. Uh, there's a great show on Hulu right now called Rami, which is an Egyptian American. Uh, there's, you know, Mindy Kaling had her show. Um, so it's slowly happening. And, and, I, and again, I think it's all universal. You tell universal stories. When I talk about my kids, I, just, I was just in Austin, Texas doing shows in front of uh, mostly non-immigrant audience. I was talking about the way I was raised versus the way my kids are raised, and they were totally getting every bit of it. So, you know, I think it's just gonna be a matter of time. Yes, I can hear you, yeah, yeah, go ahead, okay, yeah. Hi, <laughs> Wow. 
Well, I appreciate you. Yeah, she's asking, what's my relationship with my parents? I don't speak to them. Um, <laughs> I have disowned them. No, uh, it's, it's fine. You know, my father actually passed away in 2009, but my mom and I, we talk every day. And it was interesting because my mom came around eventually to accepting. I think the thing, I've, I've, I've learned to be sympathetic to my parents because I think they, they, it wasn't that they were the enemy. It was just that they wanted a, a, a um, safe, secure back uh, 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 job for you, for your life. They wanted you to have an, you know, what they felt was the right path. So it's, it's a risk, right, to get into this line of work. Uh, but once my mom came around and she saw that I could make a living doing it, and then she said, oh, wow, you're well-known in the community and all that. The, being well-known wasn't it, but it was more that when, you, when she hears other people tell her, oh, he, you know, we like him, we're a fan of his. My friend says, because uh, we, we usually when I do shows, the Persians show up, and he says, you like the Persian Elvis, otherwise known as pelvis. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, my mom came around, and it's funny because my mom now will sometimes give me, you know, she was, she, she'll give me uh, uh, her you know, her feedback on my, on some of my material. Uh, she was at the airport, she goes, I was at the airport and this, this couple, I started talking to them and somehow you came up and this and that and they said they are fans of yours but that you should write new material. Uh, I was like, thanks mom, I don't need you to be telling me that. So yeah, we have a good relationship. Yes? Well, you know, it's funny you're asked that. I just went through this process. So listen, I don't care what your background is. It's hard to get a show on air. It's hard to get people to watch it. And it's hard to be successful. It's, it's really, it's, it's a lottery thing. Same thing with movies. I mean, it seems a lot easier because when you see it, when you see a successful one, you go, oh, great. They make Crazy Rich Asians. We should do crazy whatever, whatever. Or, you know, they have this hit TV show. We should just do our own Mrs. You know, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. We can just do it. It takes a lot. So I recently went through the process where we sold a show idea, kind of like blackish, but around my life. So it was an Iranian married to an Indian. I, I would always joke and say, I'm Iranian, my wife's Indian, our nanny's Guatemalan, our kids are confused. And so it was based on that. It was kind of like blackish. It was about this guy trying to you know, navigate the world where he's American, but there's these external things and he's, and he's trying to embrace his culture and also bring it to his kids. And it was written, and, and the studio that worked with us was a powerful studio, and they said, we love this, we want to get it made, but none of the networks would do it. Now, I don't know if part of that has to do with people saying, well, you know, you're Iranian and all the conflict, and we don't know what's coming next, so we don't want to touch it, or I don't know if it's because they go, we have a lot of stuff on, on, you know, on our slate, but if I could put that show on air, I would do it tomorrow. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the path from my first stand-up comedy class to becoming a working comedian. You know, people ask me all the time about stand-up comedy. How can I do it? How can I do it? I go, it's very simple. Get on stage as much as you can. Write as much as you can. So when we first started, we would go, you know, two, three, four times a night sometimes, and you'd get as many spots as you could. And early on, you take any gig you can get. So I've performed in church basements. I've performed in strip clubs. I've performed, <laughs> yeah, the other states. Um, <laughs> Uh, I perform coffee shops. One of the worst gigs is when you'd be in a coffee shop. First of all, this is this, this how it works sometimes. You go in there, you would have to pay $5. And they say, for $5, we're going to give you three minutes of stage time and a free coffee. So you get your coffee, you go up there for three minutes, and you're, you've got three minutes. And you're going, you know, so, you know, why did the chicken cross the road? To get to the, and then all of a sudden, you hear the espresso machine. <laughs> The guy's making the foam. You're like, oh, that was my punchline. I only got two minutes left. So we would do everything. And you go, 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 go. And it's great because when you first start out, you find a group of buddies. You go together. You're recording all your sets. And you're listening to them. Your buddies are in the back of the room going, hey, have you thought about adding this joke, adding that joke? And slowly but surely, it just starts coming together. I lucked out because I became a regular. And to become a regular means at a comedy club. To become a regular, you go in front of the comedy club owner and you do a set. And then if they like you, we did, we did three minutes. If they like you, they say, come back and do six minutes the next week. Then the next week, 10 minutes. And the owner of the club, her name was Mitzi Shore. 
and she, was, she, she passed away recently. She was Pauly Shore's mother. It's the comedy store on Sunset Boulevard. Amazing, it's the mecca of comedy on the West Coast. And um, when, actually, funny story with her, by the way. Uh, I did my three, I did my six, I did my nine. This is like around 1999, 2000. And there was no comedians of Middle Eastern descent there. And once she makes you a regular, it's like joining the mafia. It really is. You're like a made man. So she'll sit on the back chair. There's an exit right here. The stage is over there. Once you're done, you have to pass her. And as you're passing her, your only hope is that she'll grab your arm. Because if she grabs your arm, that means she's going to make you a regular. If she lets you walk by, that means you've got to wait six months at least to come back. So I was walking past her, and she was already older at the time, and Mitzi talked like this, that's her way she talks, and she was notorious for helping certain comedians find their point of view, their voice. And so as I'm walking past Mitzi, she grabs my arm, and in that moment I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, I'm about to be made a regular. And she pulls me in, and she goes, you're very funny. I go, thank you, Mitzi. She goes, I'm going to make you a regular. I go, thank you, Mitzi. And she goes, have you ever thought about wearing the outfit? I go, what outfit? She goes, you know, the hat and the gown. I go, hat and gown. I go, okay, I'll wear the outfit. And I walk past her, and I was like, wait a minute. She wants me to wear a turban and a thing. And I go, oh, my God. I go, I think maybe because she's older, I go, maybe she'll forget by Monday when they're going to call me to... Well, I get the call from the booker. They go, Maz, I heard you're a regular. I go, yes. And she, go, and she goes, and Mitzi said you're going to wear the outfit. I go, oh, no. So I said, listen, I really don't want to wear the outfit. She goes, well, if you don't wear the outfit, you might not end up on stage. And so I had to think. I had to think. And what had happened was around that time, there was actually an Iranian guy. So a lot of Iranians in the West uh, criticize the Iranian government. And there's a lot of Persian TV stations. And they'll get on those shows, and they'll criticize the government in Iran. Well, there was a guy who had been famous for dressing like the mullahs and making fun of them. So he ended up at a rally at the federal building in Westwood where he was making fun of the mullahs and some mullah supporters showed up and threw rocks at him and blinded him. So with the knowledge of that story, I called up the club. I said, listen, I could wear the outfit, but you know, people might show up and attack me and maybe the club. And so the booker goes, uh, let me call you right back. So I guess in the interim, she called Mitzi and called me back. She goes, listen, just wear something comfortable. You'll be good to go. <laughs> so I got out of wearing the outfit. But, but becoming a regular at the comedy store was the biggest uh, training ground for me. Because what would happen is, and you're asking about stand-up comedy, getting up in front of an audience that has zero interest in you is how you grow. So they would give you, they would, when you first start out, you're not going to get the 10 p.m. spot when the crowd's like, woo. You're going to get the 1230 spot. And you'll show up at 1230, and you'll get ready to go on stage, and a celebrity comedian will walk into the club and go, hey, I'm going next. And then you'll have to sit there for an hour and watch this guy do his thing. Now it's 130, and then someone else will walk in. There was a couple times I got up at like 145 when the club was going to close at 2. It was a 15-minute set, so I was basically closing out the club. And there was just three people in the club. And one of the first times when I realized I stopped doing my act, I just started talking to them. I go, why are you guys here? Like, I'm here because I'm trying to do my act. What are you guys doing? And it became a conversation, and jokes came out of it, and I grew ex exponentially doing that. So that's your long answer. <laughs> Any other questions? Right here, this gentleman. Um, I have three um, short questions. First of all, um, which city in Italy did you go to? I went to Padova in the uh, north, Padua. Right Pardon. near Venice. Okay. Second one, um, let me see if I remember. Yeah, what exactly do they teach you in the comedy club? Uh, so, I mean, how do they teach you to be funny? Or what the <laughs> heck is going on in the club? You know I know, I mean? they haven't taught me to be funny yet. Um, <laughs> no, it was, it was a comedy class that I took early on. So I took, there's improv acting classes, which you can take, which is all about improv acting, which is, you know, get on stage with other actors and people throw suggestions and you make a scene. And then there's stand-up comedy classes. And the, the one thing that I got out of the stand-up comedy class, really to be a comedian, you gotta go do what's called open mic nights, which is when you go, again, to a bar or wherever it is, you go on stage, you try your three minutes, and hopefully you get a couple of laughs, and you keep going for five to 10 years and eventually get good at it. The comedy cl class, what it did was, this lady had written a book that had certain uh, um, uh, 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 advice on how to write your jokes, what to write about. 
And then you got to go in front of the class and try your act. Every week you would come back with a new act and try it in front of the class. So, whereas when you go to an open mic, none, none of the other comedians are going to give you feedback because they're all there worried about their own show. When you're in the class, you do the show, then they go around the class, everybody gives you some feedback. So it helps a little bit. But really, ultimately, with stand-up, it's just get on stage and write as much as you can. And what's your third question? Yeah, third question is uh, people who are not native speaker, um, what do you recommend them to improve you know, uh, their being on the stage or how to... Listen, whether, you're, you whether you're not a native speaker or whatever it is, I highly recommend if you can find classes that are public speaking classes and all that. I mean, it's, it can only help. Just keep getting on, on stage over and over and over, whether it's a class, uh, whether it's, you know, in, in groups and seminars. It's just amazing how your comfort level starts to grow. And you realize, by the way, you realize that like, because you make a big deal out of it. You go, oh my God, I'm being judged by everybody. No, half the people are waiting, they can't wait for you to stop talking so they can check their phones. Like nobody's paying attention. So once you kind of lower the stakes, you're gonna be fine. Find a class. I think we have time for about one more. One more question. Right there, right here, yeah, go ahead, sir. Okay, so I have a daughter who has to take a public speaking class. Uh -huh. Great. And she says, I don't want to go on the day that you have to give a speech about yourself. What do you do to help a really shy person who has a lot to say, say it? Wow, that's a tough one. I think, you know, if, if there's a way to just, you know, my daughter, she's now nine. But when she was like four or five, at home she'd be very uh, outgoing and jumping around and dancing. But then in public, she would get really shy about stuff. So we tried to kind of, um, again, lower the stakes for her. We would say things like, listen, because she would take some, some classes uh, uh, for theater classes in school. And we'd say, listen, when you're up there, don't even look at the audience. One of the things I tell people, I go, if you look above the audience, they think you're looking at them, but you're looking above them. So don't look at them. Just look above them and do your thing. And maybe if she gets through it once doing that, eventually she'll do it a couple times like that and go, oh, that was pretty easy, and then feel more comfortable looking at the audience. You know, so whatever you can do to make it easier. I've heard of people in some classes allow the student to turn their back and do the thing like this and get the words out, you know, not having, just, you know what I'm saying? Just try and lower the stakes as much as you can, and hopefully the, the, the teacher of that class has some techniques too. Please join me in thanking Maz Jabrani for such an inspiring evening. Thank you, and thank you guys. Thank you all very much. It was a pleasure coming down here, and beautiful meeting you guys, and uh, what wonderful people. Onward and upward. <laughs>